Thank you, Madam Speaker, colleagues, uh, and most of all, friends. It is my honor to provide over, preside over today's testimonials by members of Congress about the events of January 6, 2021. The people you will hear from today come from around the country. They represent the rich diversity of our nation, and their voices strike true. They are, in my book, patriots whose dedication to our nation is total. Their courage inspires me every day. But more than anything, perhaps, they are my friends. It is said that truth dies when people stop speaking it. Well, it will not die on our watch. And with that, it is my honor to recognize Lisa Blunt Rochester from the state of Delaware. Thank you, Jason. Madam Speaker, my dear, dear colleagues and the American family, good afternoon. Let me begin, Madam Speaker, by thanking you for the opportunity for all of us to gather today and for this occasion to properly contextualize for history the events of January 6, 2021. For me, January 6 will forever be known as a day of remembrance, reflection, and recommitment. I remember waking up that morning tense but excited, excited to participate and witness the certification of Delaware's first American president. It was the culmination of a hard fought campaign in the midst of a historic pandemic. I, know, I had no idea that the safest, most secure election of our lifetime would on that day turn into a violent insurrection. January 6 for me will forever be a day to remember how the light of acts of courage, small and large, defeated darkness. Heroes, staffers, uh, custodians, police. I will remember those who quite literally gave their lives a day of reflection. I reflect on that day being trapped in the gallery, ultimately praying for all of our safety and peace in our nation. I also reflect on just how close, how close we were to losing it, to losing our democracy. Those of us trapped in the gallery, we lived it, ducking, crawling, under, over railings, hands, knees, the sounds, the smells. We had a front row seat to what lies, hate, or plain old misinformation conjures. We went from victims to witnesses, and today we are messengers. We reflect on the fact that January 6th was about so much more than an effort to break into a building. It was an effort to break down our institutions. And I must admit to you, my colleagues, that over this past year, um, there have been times when I felt that justice was not swift enough. I felt sad, I felt mad, I felt bewildered that some minim minimize the day and continue to minimize it. But we don't give up. Because in the words of poet William Cullen Bryant and quoted by Martin Luther King, truth crushed to earth shall rise. Truth crushed to earth shall rise. So on this day, let us recommit to our democracy and to each other. On the day that I was sworn into Congress, as many of my colleagues know, um, I was the first African-American and the first woman from the state of Delaware elected to Congress. And I carried this scarf with me. It marked uh, 
an X that my great, great, great grandfather used to sign this returns of qualified voter registration of 1867 in Georgia. I also carried it on the day of the insurrection because it is my proof of what we have overcome. And it is my inspiration for what is yet to be done as we work towards a more perfect union. I continue to have hope even when I feel hopeless because my ancestors would have it no other way. And because scripture tells us that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And while I remember a great deal that day, what I remember most is walking back onto the house floor, into the chamber that morning to complete our work, the morning when democracy prevailed. Remember, reflect, recommit. Thank you, Lisa. Now I recognize Dan Kildee from the state of Michigan. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to provide this testimony. I first want to express my gratitude to the Capitol Police. As one of the members trapped in the House Gallery on January 6, you saved our lives. And by defending the Capitol, you literally saved our nation from a deadly mob determined to stop democracy. The law enforcement officers are the true heroes of January 6, and every American, every single American, owes them a great debt of gratitude. As I lay on the, house, uh, on the floor of the House Gallery, and as I called my family to tell them I was safe, even though I was not sure that I was, it occurred to me that I was in the same spot where I sat 44 years earlier as I watched my Uncle Dale being first sworn in to Congress. A beautiful memory. And now that memory is replaced by one of me sheltering myself from a violent mob, a mob whipped up by a former president pushing a cynical and dangerous lie determined to overturn an election to keep, and to keep us, Congress, from our constitutional duty to certify the election and ensure the peaceful transfer of power. As many of you know, for me personally, the path forward after January 6 has not been an easy one. It's been made more painful, however, by the fact that most of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle continue to accommodate that big lie that was the predicate for the attack on our country. As the speaker said, however, thankfully, gratefully, democracy won on that day. The insurrectionists lost. But January 6 is not over. January 6 is not behind us. The threat and the lie that, that fuels that threat continues to rear its head in other forms. That threat exists today in further threats of violence against elected and appointed officials meant to intimidate. That threat exists today in state legislatures and local clerk's offices across the country where one party continues to try to undo the democratic process and make it harder for Americans to have their voices heard at the ballot box. If we as members of Congress all act with the same patriotism and courage that those brave law enforcement officers exemplified on January 6, I know we can stop this ongoing effort to bend our democracy. But to truly, truly protect our democracy, we need truth. Truth is clear as this shard of broken glass that I have carried with me for the last 365 days. Glass that I picked up from a broken window in the Capitol in the aftermath of January 6th as a reminder 
constant reminder in my pocket of the brutality of that day. We must have truth. We must have accountability. Only truth and accountability will give us the opportunity to find a path toward reconciliation. Only truth will begin to thaw the bitterness that characterizes our current divisions. We live in an amazing place, the greatest country in the world, the United States of America. But our democracy is only what we make it. Our democracy does not run on autopilot. One year ago, we came dangerously close to an attack to stop our democracy from succeeding in our country and for our country to heal and to move forward. What we need in this country now more than ever, most of all, is truth and leaders who are willing to stand up for truth, even when it's hard. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, before I go to our next speaker, I was just informed that uh, the parents of Officer Brian Sicknick, Charles and Gladys Sicknick, have joined us today. Would you please um, stand, Charles and Gladys, and be recognized? For those of you joining us at home, Brian Sicknick was an officer who gave his life on January 6, 2021, in defense of this capital, in defense of many of us. And we sitting here owe your family a debt of gratitude that we can never repay. We will be there for you and your family going forward, and you are now a part of our family as well. Uh, it's now my honor to recognize my friend, Annie Custer, from the state of New Hampshire. Madam Speaker, to my colleagues and friends, to the Sicknick family, and to America, 1,000 acts of courage saved my life and our democracy one year ago today in the January 6th attack on our Capitol. I am here today as both a survivor and a witness to the brutal and violent attack that threatened my life and continues to threaten the future of our democracy. America does not yet know just how close we, the members here in this room today, our nation and our democracy, came to our demise that terrifying day. 1,000 acts of courage by the Capitol Police, by the DC Metro Police, by House staff saved our lives and saved the future of our democracy. I was in the House Gallery with my colleagues to witness the certification of the election of Joe Biden as our president and Kamala Harris as our historic vice president. We could hear the shouting and commotion in the hallway outside the gallery, and then the pounding on the door to the chamber as the members on the House floor were evacuated. Terror and adrenaline coursed through our bodies as we lay on the floor hidden behind the gallery rail. I grabbed the hand of my colleague, Sarah Jacobs, just 31 years old on her fourth day of Congress. Sarah, I whispered, we have to crawl around this corner to get out of the line of fire. We were all terrified, and we thought that we would die. Suddenly, a Capitol Police officer shouted, run, 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 run. We scrambled across the entire length of the gallery, crouching down, ducking down under the railings, terrified by the pounding on the door and the shouting outside the chamber. A tall, brave officer grabbed four of us and said, I will get you to the elevator. I will get you to safety. As we ducked into the elevator, just as the raging rioters came charging down that third floor hallway, 1,000 acts of courage saved my life and saved our democracy by moments, not minutes. 
every struggle slowed the monstrous mob saving our lives, what would they have done to us, 40 or 50 feet, seconds away from us, bear spray, tear us limb from limb, kidnap or kill four members of Congress, or many, many more? Seconds later, our colleague Jason Crow, a former Army Ranger, heard the commotion in the hall and commanded the police to lock that last gallery door. Two dozen members of Congress and a dozen or more journalists were pinned down for the next eight and a half minutes while the riot police finally subdued the terrorist mob. When my colleagues finally evacuated the gallery, the rioters were sprawled on the floor with guns to their heads. A combat scene that no one could begin to imagine in the halls of Congress. We survived that day. We are here today as survivors and witnesses. We returned to the chamber that night. At 3.30 a.m., we certified the election of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. But let us never forget how close we came. Let us carry a thousand acts of courage in our hearts and act to save our democracy today and every day. God bless America. Thank you, Annie Custer. And now I recognize my friend Adam Schiff from California. Thank you, Jason, Madam Speaker, my colleagues. One year ago, I was on the House floor when the mob attacked our Capitol. As one of a few members, the Speaker had asked to manage the opposition to efforts to decertify the results of the presidential election. I had six arguments and six rebuttals to make on the challenges to the electors from six different states. And so I wasn't really paying attention to what was happening outside the building, to the growing mass of rioters, to efforts to break into the building. It was not until our leadership was swiftly removed from the chamber and police announced that we needed to take out our gas masks that I understood the full extent of the danger. When the order came to evacuate, I stayed behind for a while until two Republicans came up to me. One of them said, you can't let them see you. I know these people. I can talk to these people. I can talk my way through these people. You're in a whole different category. Thanks to the courage of the police officers that day, we were safe. And we returned to the chamber that night to finish the work and certify the results. And our democracy moved forward, weakened, yes, defiled even, by the shameful action of the insurrectionists, but as ever, resilient. I pray that this solemn anniversary be a reawakening of our devotion to our democracy, that it serve as the most potent reminder that the freedoms we enjoy are not an inevitable birthright bequeathed by our founders, but a treasure to be jealously guarded. As Americans, we have a very proud legacy to cherish. It's time we remembered that. It's time we defended our democracy like our lives, our liberties, and our very happiness depended upon it. Because they do. Because they do. Thank you. Thank you, Adam Schiff. Uh, I now recognize Val Demings from Florida. Madam Speaker, Mr. and Mrs. Sicknick, to my colleagues and other special guests, I stand before you today as a 27-year law enforcement officer. A police officer's oath of office says that I do solemnly swear that I will support, protect, and defend 
the Constitution and government of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith, loyalty, and allegiance to the same, and that I am entitled to hold office under the Constitution, and that I will faithfully perform all of the duties under the Constitution, so help me God. When the police officers reported for duty one year ago today, they came as they always do, ready to faithfully perform all of the duties. But they had no idea what they would face. It seems a lot of people at all levels knew or should have known just how far this violent mob and their enablers would go. But the officers were ambushed by this violent mob who had total disregard for the officer's oath, their records of service, their families, and their safety. As a former police chief, I shall never forget what I witnessed one year ago today. And America should never forget either. I know the Capitol Police officers and others took their oath seriously because I saw them fighting with every ounce of strength, courage, commitment, and energy that they could muster up. But you know what? As members of Congress, both in the upper chamber and the lower chamber, we have taken an oath too. But some have forgotten that oath. Some oath is overshadowed by their quest for power and their pathetic fear of election officials counting every vote. I want to thank the police officers for defending and protecting us that day, but they did so much more. They also protected our democracy. Many people call themselves patriots, but true patriots don't lie, they don't steal, they don't cheat, they aren't cowards. They don't push lies for political or financial gain. But out of the ashes, good things can rise. The bright spots one year ago today, the police officers who defended us and the certification of the electoral ballots. Our democracy stood and the enemies of our democracy lost. I will support, protect, and defend because America is worth it. God bless you all. Thank you, Val Demings. And now I recognize my friend Colin Allred from the state of Texas. Madam Speaker, my colleagues, the Signick family, I have to tell you a little bit how I came to be in the Congress. I, I took the normal route. I was raised by a single mother, played in the NFL, went to law school, and became a civil rights lawyer. <laughs> I thought when I left the NFL as a linebacker, where my job was to put people on the ground, that 
those abilities and the need to do that were over. On January 6th, along with my friends and colleagues, Akeem Jeffries and Ruben Gallego and Eric Swalwell and others, Pete Aguilar, we took off our suit jacket coats on the House floor, the first time I've ever done that. And we were ready to try and defend our colleagues from whatever was going to come through those doors. And we saw the mob at the doors. As we were exiting the House floor, I saw the glass breaking. I saw the officers staying behind with their guns drawn. And I thought about the opportunity they'd given me. Because, as I said, I was raised by a single mother, but I'm a father now. I had a 23-month-old son at home, and I had a baby on the way in two more months. Had those officers not held that line, I would not have met my son, Cameron. So for me, January 6th, I, I don't see it as a member of Congress so much. I see it as a father, as somebody who, because I didn't know mine, I've always been committed to making sure that my boys knew me. And so to the Signic family, I'll say to you, your son's sacrifice allowed me to meet mine. The overwhelming feeling I felt on January 6th was one of sadness. Sadness for our country. Sadness for the country that I thought I might have to leave to my boys. But in the time since then, and I really mean this, my sadness has become a resolve. I'm determined to do whatever I can to save our democracy, because it's worth saving. For my boys and the country they'll inherit, for their children and their children's children, we cannot let the mob, the authoritarians, people who, in President Bush's words, reject pluralism, reject modernity, reject our way of life when. And that brings me to my final point, which is that, as so many of us have said, however long our republic stands, I don't think people will remember that we had to evacuate the House floor. I hope they won't. Or not only that, maybe. I hope they'll remember that we came back. While there was still blood on the walls, still broken glass on the floor, while we ourselves were shaken, we came back. And we voted to certify an American presidential election. It's my honor to serve with every single one of you. I'm sorry that we've gone through this together. But I tell you, our country's worth it. Our democracy is worth it. And the people in this room, to Mr. Meacham's words, are the ones who are standing in the breach. And I'm proud to stand with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colin Allred. Uh, and now uh, I'm proud to recognize Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut. Madam Speaker, Mr. and Mrs. Sitnik, thank you. A thank you to Congressman Crow for presiding over this somber day of reflection and remembrance as we commemorate the one-year anniversary 
of the January 6th assault on this institution and the assault on our democracy. Just a year ago, Congressman Crow, you fought to keep the protesters out of the House chamber, and you gave the rest of us in the gallery direction and strength and helped us to protect ourselves. And for that, we are grateful. Keep your head down. Take your pin off. You are a remarkable leader, and we thank you. On January 6, 2021, our nation gazed into the abyss and understood more fully than ever that our democracy is fragile. A year later, it is difficult to comprehend the gravity of this attack on our democracy. But I will never forget that amid this insurrection, the Capitol Police who told us to, quote, hit the floor, grab the gas masks under our seats. I had no idea there were gas masks under our seats. As the mob headed for the House chamber, and when they said the Capitol had been breached, there was tear gas in Statuary Hall, and they were on, our way, on their way to the chamber doors, and that's a very short walk to the chamber doors. Trapped in the gallery with my colleagues, so many of here today, we held on to one another. We watched out for one another. We made sure that we could get over the railings or under the railings. And I'll never forget Marcy Kaptur, who said, this is a little bit like the limbo, over and under. And yet you had a little bit of levity. Uh, but we did. We looked back to say, are, are you with us? Let's go, as we made our way around the perimeter of the Capitol. And I will never forget lying on the floor behind those seats. And when the officer said, hit the floor, there are gunshots. We saw the chamber doors smashed. We saw the, the police with guns drawn. And we heard the shots from the speaker's lobby. And I remember I was laying on the floor, and I had just a very little bit of juice left in my cell phone. And I wanted to call my husband. I wanted to call Stan. I was afraid to say I love you because it harkened back to September 11th and those last calls. So I just said, I'm all right. Tell the kids I am all right. They are going to get us out of here. And I hung up the phone. And then when they did get us out through those ceremonial doors, um, we, we saw the rioters spread eagled on the floor with the Capitol Police with guns standing over them. And they got us to safety. As my colleagues have said, they saved our lives at risk of their own. But we mark this day by also recognizing the resilience of our democracy. On that day, our institutions withstood the threat. We overcame the chaos. And let it be a reminder of just how remarkable America is. Together, we stood up for the union, and we protected the basic functions of our democracy. We continued the quest to build a more perfect union. And the principles of our Constitution not only survived this crisis, but proved once again that our democratic system works and remains a beacon of hope for the world. And that is why it is so important that we continue to have a full investigation of those events one year ago, so that they never happen again. We seek the truth recognize what happened so that we can move forward. It is why we must safeguard our elections by passing voter rights legislation that will protect that right to vote. The right to vote is the ultimate defense against insurrection. It is why we must continue the work of the January 6th committee led by Congressman Benny Thompson and Congresswoman Liz Cheney. And that is why 
those of us who have the capacity in whatever committees we serve on, that where we passed into law almost a billion dollars to fund the Capitol Police and to secure the U.S. Capitol, the citadel of democracy. One year ago, our democracy was tested, but we prevailed. Our institutions and the rule of law triumphed on January 6th. And despite rioters and protests, we performed our constitutional duty. Yes, we were delayed, but our efforts were undeterred. We pray for the officers and their families who made the ultimate sacrifice. We honor their sacrifices by taking a hard look at just what happened on that dark day and what we need to do to ensure such an alarming breach in our capital security never happens again. We must never forget January 6th. We must never lose sight of what happened. And we must never stop fighting for our democracy. In the immortal words of Alexis de Tocqueville, and I quote, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. Let that be the enduring lesson of January 6th. Thank you, my colleagues, and God bless this institution and all of you. Thank you, Rosa DeLauro. Uh, and next, I recognize my friend Sarah Jacobs from California. Well, thank you, Jason, for putting this on and for the glass of whiskey you poured me after we finally got back to our offices on January 6th. And Madam Speaker, thank you for your leadership during this time. January 6th was my fourth day in office. January 6th was my first time ever to the House Gallery. My team had to walk me there because I didn't know how to get through the Capitol yet. I'll never forget the buzzing of the escape hoods the fear when I couldn't open the packaging, the sound of the doors closing and being locked, introducing myself to my colleagues as we were hiding under the chairs, any Custer grabbing my hand, fashioning weapons out of stanchions and pens and my high heels, ready to take on the rioters who were banging on the doors behind us, climbing over chairs and under rails, not sure where the rioters were and if we were going fast enough to escape them, Wondering if the bruises I found later that night were from dropping to the floor so many times or from our rushed escape. Waiting for the elevator door to open. Sure we were going to see a machine gun and for it all to be over. The Capitol Police officer who put his body in the way in case that happened. Looking to my right and seeing the mob as we rushed to get out, seconds away from getting us. I'll never forget just how close we came to losing our democracy that day. But I'll also never forget the feeling as I was sitting there under my chair that I knew what we needed to do, that I was here for a reason. Because I'd spent my career working on conflict and political violence at the UN and the State Department. I'd worked on post-coup transitions and responses to violent extremism and electoral violence in places around the world. I'd been in scary situations before. And I'd advise many other countries about what they should do. I just never thought I'd need to use that experience here. I never thought that the most dangerous place I could be was the United States Capitol. But on January 6th, the United States Capitol became a complex setting. And although we eventually secured the building and returned to work that night, the conflict isn't over. January 6th was not the end. It was the beginning. And I know that many people are afraid about what this means for the future of our country as we see the threat morph from a violent mob to a more insidious effort to use the institutions themselves to overturn the will of the people. And those threats to our democracy are real. But I'm optimistic because I've seen countries torn apart even more than ours are find a way to put themselves back together. I know that it's possible. All it takes is each of us, regardless of party, coming together to decide that our democracy is worth defending. And I know that all of us here today are ready to do that. Thank you.
Thank you, Sarah Jacobs. Uh, and next, I recognize my friend Tom Malinowski from New Jersey. Thank you, Jason, Madam Speaker, Mr. and Mrs. Sicknick, um, my colleagues. As many of you know, I was born in a communist country, came to America as a child, and when I grew up, I spent most of my career before coming to Congress as a human rights advocate and as an American diplomat, trying to champion to dictatorships around the world the idea of American democracy. So I have my own particular perspective on what makes America special and on why so many people around the world to this day dream of becoming American. It's not just words like democracy and liberty. More than that, it is because of an idea that is embedded in the Constitution of the United States, the idea that everyone in America, no matter how powerful, is supposed to play by the same rules. And every American election is an opportunity to show that, to show what it means. Unlike in many other countries, our winners don't assume absolute power to do whatever they may want. Our losers understand that their rights are preserved, and they accept defeat. We've all been there and live to fight another day. So on January 6th, a year ago, I was desperate to be in the House Gallery. I wanted to be there to see the ceremony that would mark the continuation of this sacred tradition. I was optimistic. At 1121, I pulled out my little Twitter machine and I, and I wrote, today is a celebration of democracy. The people have voted. The only power we have as representatives and senators under the Constitution we swore to defend is to count the ballots and we will. Two hours later, we all know what happened. We lived it together. We saw from the gallery the speaker being evacuated. We heard the hiss of the gas masks. We heard the voice of the chaplain praying. Some of us tried to lock those doors. We failed. We didn't see what we saw in the video. We didn't see the battle outside. So maybe I wasn't as afraid as I should have been but here's what I was thinking. I was thinking about moments in my life where I had been in dangerous situations outside the United States. There was a time when I found myself being chased in the middle of the night by riot police in a Middle Eastern city. It's a long story. I thought about a time when I visited Syria and Libya during their civil wars, and I thought how absolutely absurd it was that here I was standing in the inner sanctum of American democracy in Washington, D.C., feeling the same rush of adrenaline, the same sense of danger as in those places. How could it be happening here? I was furious. And all I could say to everybody as we fled and as we came to that place of safety in the House office building was the moment we got the all clear, we had to go back in there and finish the job of certifying the election, and thank goodness we did. Ever since, those who want us to move on from January 6th have tried to get away with blaming the rioters alone for the attack. It's like saying that the hijackers alone were responsible for 9-11. The real question is what could have motivated those thousands of otherwise ordinary Americans to commit such a deviant act? Social media created the echo chamber in which the lie spread, but the root cause was the lie itself. Today, more Americans believe the election was stolen than a year ago. More Americans believe that violence against their government is justified than a year ago. On January 6, 2021, we thwarted the attack on the Capitol. On January 6, 2022, the attack on our democracy continues. And as we defend that democracy, let us remember there is no constitutional police in America. There is no constitutional jail in America. The rules underpinning our system of government and the peace it preserves have always been based only on our consent. We either agree voluntarily 
to abide by those rules even when we lose an election or we lose our country. I do not want to lose the country that my family chose. I do not want to lose the glorious example that America sets, that our democracy sets for the rest of the world. Those are the stakes. We cannot, we will not fail. Thank you. Thank you, Tom Malinowski. Uh, now I recognize my friend Pramila Jayapal from Washington. Thank you, Jason. Madam Speaker, thank you for your strength and for your leadership. My colleagues, this is a somber day for our democracy as we mark one year from the deadliest and most destructive attack on our capital since the War of 1812. Like many of you trapped in the House Gallery, I remember every moment vividly. I viscerally feel the pounding on the gallery doors. I hear the shot ringing out. I replay how I made plans to use my gas mask and my cane, newly at my side from a five-week-old knee replacement surgery to fight back if attacked. And I remember not knowing if I would make it out of our seat of democracy alive or if our democracy itself would survive. But January 6th was also the day that we saved our democracy. And the we I am referring to is broad and deep. All the voters that came out in the most important election in our lifetimes that delivered us a new president who is not corrupted by his love of power and lack of regard for our Constitution, the many Capitol Police officers who put so much on the line to stop the insurrectionists, the Capitol staff, the journalists, our own staff, and so many more who were both witnesses and victims, and yes, all of us as members of Congress who went back that night to certify that election because it was our job, the very thing we came to this place to do. The challenge with today for me is that we are not marking something that is over and done with. The danger is still clear and it is still present. Our democracy is very fragile, and the cult of the big lie is still very much in action with the help of the vast majority of our colleagues on the other side who continue to try to rewrite or ignore history. Its own form of violence on all those who saw and experienced that day. And that is why the work of the Select Committee and the Department of Justice to bring accountability is so critically important because there is no healing without truth and justice. So today is also about the work ahead. It is about the resolve that we must have to not stop until every single person who was involved in the insurrection is held fully accountable. It is about bringing to justice a president who was dead set on overturning an election. And it is about understanding that January 6th is not divorced from the 400 plus pieces of voter suppression legislation introduced in the past 365 days to take on this concerted effort to undermine democracy, our work ahead must include signing into law strong voting rights legislation. Let us not gloss over the fact that in the years since this deadly attack, we have all had to do our jobs and be human. We have done that in the face of denials of truth and rewriting of history from the very colleagues who were running for their own lives that day. So I am once again reminded that being human is a courageous act. It means you are willing to fight for the things that are the hardest, to even be disappointed or hurt or angered, but to still do what is right and what is just because that is the only way that change happens. Our courage and our resolve only grow from this crisis and the responsibility that is upon us to protect our democracy for years to come.
Thank you, Pramila Jayapal. And I'll recognize my friend and fellow veteran, Mikey Sherrill from New Jersey. Well, thank you, Jason. It's truly an honor to be here with everyone today, my gallery group friends, the Sicknick family. There were so many acts of courage that day. And I'm standing here, and I want to share with you that I have a deep and abiding faith in the people of this country. I have so much hope for our children and so much love and faith in our country. And I want to share a couple stories from that day so you know why. I'll tell you two stories of people I was with that day and one story of someone I wasn't with. First of all, Dan Kildee. I heard you make that call to your family. I don't think you thought you were going to leave the floor safely that day. And yet you used that trauma you had the courage to share it with people across this country, as so many people have been suffering their own mental health problems. And I think because of your courage in doing that, people across this country have sought out the mental health treatment they need. When I think about that day, I think of Pramila Jayapal, who you just heard from. Pramila, I can't imagine being on the floor, having the house attacked, and not even being sure that as we needed to flee that room, if you could walk. And as we went down stairway after stairway after stairway, when I could feel your knee buckling, your calm, dignity, and courage in leading people to safety will stay with me. And finally, I have to share my feelings about someone who was not with me in the gallery group, who was there that day. You know, when you serve in the military, you see acts of physical courage quite often. But when you get out of the military and you start serving your country in different ways, you realize that often what is called upon is for moral courage. And you see acts of moral courage far more infrequently. And so I think it's appropriate to point out one person who I think has shown a great deal of moral courage, someone who stood up for her country at great personal cost, and that's Liz Cheney, a person who truly has done her duty to her country. And so as I stand here, I simply want to say to all of you, God bless all of you and your families. God bless the Capitol Police officers, like Officer Sicknick, who, Sicknick, who enabled us all to go home to our families. God bless the Congress of the United States of America, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you, Mikey Sherrill. Uh, now I recognize my friend Mike Quigley from Illinois. Thank you, Jason. Madam Speaker, my friends, the Sicknick family, we all uh, remember the images. Uh, there's a photo I saw the other day I had completely forgot about. We've seen the images, we know what to expect. The broken glass, the guns drawn, the makeshift barricades, members sheltering in place, but I saw something I had forgotten. It was a reporter in the midst of all this bent over her keyboard, still working, right? John, you're right, we're in the breach. We were in the breach that day, but there were others there. Jefferson said, if he had to choose between a country that had a government with no newspapers and a country that had newspapers with no government, he would choose the latter. We're all talking about protecting our democracies, and that's the altogether fitting and proper thing to do. But who else was a target but those whose job it is to try to bring the truth the best they can to the American people? And those that storm the Capitol today believe that the truth is the enemy. So I want to thank those members of the press who may not always agree with us, but we recognize you that we are partners in keeping this great experiment going. 
Second image I want to remind myself of all the time is when I think of the officers, uh, about a half an hour before we began the debate, I looked out over the East Capitol steps and I saw there was a huge mob there too, itching for a fight. I saw three Capitol Police in ball caps, no riot gear, no proper equipment, standing virtually alone against extraordinary odds. And as has been said, I know I wouldn't be here without them, and I question whether our country would be. A final thought, uh, we just heard our friend Ms. Jayapal talk about uh, the fact that she was walking with a cane that day, and I say this with the greatest love, because it is the quintessential heartfelt moment that I was involved with personally. As we were uh, walking along the tracks away toward our meeting room to get away, um, and I want to paraphrase it, what I think I heard you say was something that you were, she was upset that she was walking so slowly with her cane that she was afraid that that would allow the insurrectionists to catch up to us. And Brad Schneider was just ahead of us, and he heard her say this, and he came back and walked on her left side, and he said, well, then we'll just all walk together. I was never more proud at that moment to walk alongside all of you. It reminds me that we have to walk alongside and help guide our country away from darkness as we walk together into that bright light of our democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Mike Quigley. And next, I recognize my friend Sheila Jackson Lee from Texas. My former professor, Maya Angelou, said, if they show you who they are, that is who they are. The patriots in this room, on the floor, the American people, have shown the world who we are. There was a scripture this morning that said, let the light shine, arise and shine. And I thought, although a lot of trepidation this morning, even to the extent of a restless night, thinking of that day, I got inspiration from letting the light shine. To Mr. and Mrs. Sicknick, I thought very extensively about coming back to Washington simply to honor your son and those who lost their lives. We thank you. We say thank you to our law enforcement officers, frontliners of all kinds, our central workers. And yes, although they tried to get here early, thwarted by the lack of responsibility of the then commander in chief, we thank the National Guard and all others. But I'm reminded of that day in the gallery. And as I watched a lot of scurrying of my friends on the other side of the aisle, we were still sort of in the mood of counting this celebratory moment. I heard Joyce, our faithful Sergeant of Arms staff person, shouting, close the doors. We were still in a daze. And then I saw the Capitol Police rushing to close doors and then explaining to us, get out, get down. I'm always with a scarf and books and papers, and there was a time when I had to drop them all. And I watched our members cowering and going. Each one in their own way was brave, and I know they want no accounting for that. But we were scurrying with the thought that we might not live. I was here for 9-11. I was in the building, in a meeting refused to acknowledge the noise that was outside until someone busted in and said, you have to run for your life. On that day, we were running together. We're running as Republicans, Democrats, Americans, 
We were fearful together. We were hopeful together. When I went down those steps, steps of the carriage entrance, and they said, we don't know what's happening. Run for your life. But the rumors in those failed Blackberries, we were hearing rumors. It's the Capitol. It's the White House. It's the State Department. But we could see the black smoke in the Pentagon. But yet we had each other. As we were scurrying here, the big lie was looming. And you wondered, why were you against what was so good about America, the peaceful transfer of power? Why were you not willing to listen, as the Vice President read today, about a more perfect union, or understand that we cannot bury history, as the President said. We must remember it. And we must remember that day, January 6, 2021. In my social media, I was called the B word. It said, if you, know, if you are a thug, you know a thug. You are a thug. So many people had those kinds of attacks because we were calling for healing. But yet I can tell you that even as the phones were ringing and you had to say to friends, family, we're under siege, but we're going to make it. Those moments of camaraderie of our fellow sisters and brothers of helping each other, the idea that we cowered for a period of time, and maybe that's not a word, we bent down, we were told what to do. The fact that we could see those barricading the doors, but hearing the noise and hoping that those doors would not yield because we felt any minute they would be on the floor of the house. Remember, we could not see any video and did not know what we were surrounded by. But the one noise that I will never forget is a shot. You kept thinking, the television, is that a gunshot? Then that means they're here, and their aims are good. And for those in the cloakroom or in the speaker's lobby, those trying to get off the floor, those in the gallery, they must have good aims, or they must be coming in all directions. The thing that troubles me the most, but I believe in the beloved community taught by the words of Martin King and John Lewis, who I remind you of today, he kept telling us about the beloved community and all of his fights, his marches against gun violence. He was always saying the beloved community. But it's shameful when we have members of Congress in May of 2021 saying, without the video, they just thought it was a group of tourists denying truth. But I am here today to be able to, again, simply place honor where honor is due. Thank you, Jason, for your service in this nation's military and all of our colleagues and all others. But you put on the uniform, uniform unselfishly because you believed in democracy. So I'm here now to ensure that this little book that Barbara Jordan told me to call as an important document to carry around to be able to say that that day was a frightening day and I didn't know as on 9-11 whether I would live or die. But I was certainly in the breach with patriots who will continue to do that. And so all that members who are still accepting the big lie, the tourist day, attacking presidents and other members of Congress, I can still feel that we as patriots a part of this beloved community. And then when I was privileged to gavel that last moment at 3.49 a.m. that we had overcome, we had overcome, and that we'd never look back to say that we could not stand together united. We would not fail. We would be those who stood in the gap. We would be the ones who'd be the holders of the breach and stand against evilness. And yes, we would say that we have worked and will work to create a more perfect union. And as well, we'll coddle democracy, hold it, nurture it, view it as a baby, needing our arms and never letting it go. I'm glad to stand before all of you as patriots, and I'm glad to not forget the history of this nation. May God bless you. And God bless the United States of America.
Thank you, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee. And next, my friend uh, Don Norcross from New Jersey. Good afternoon. Speaker, thank you for your constant reminder of us, what we're doing here and what this is about. And to those who kept us safe on that day. I came to these great halls from a slightly different angle, but we all represent our districts around this great country. I serve with some of the smartest people I've ever met in my life, but I went to a different school. I went to an apprenticeship. I was an electrician. So when we talk about what happens that day, I like to think about the people I represent back in New Jersey. I was really excited. We're going to certify an election. I'm going to have the opportunity to be there. Wow. The peaceful transfer of power, stuff we learned about back in civics class. Really excited there. My chief had talked to me the day before saying the staff is really nervous about what's going on and they'd like to stay home for the day. I will admit I'm there. Really? Okay, sure, no problem. We've been briefed several times on the security measures that were gonna take place. We're gonna be all right, they got this covered. They got this covered. Well, looking back on the six, for many of us, that faith in democracy was challenged. Certainly was shaken. I started reading the text messages from my chief that the mob was coming. Okay, they're moving up the mall. Police will handle this, they got this covered. I'm a labor guy from Jersey. I participated in a few picket lines in my life. But I will tell you, they're loud, they're rambunctious, they get moving. But January 6th was no protest. It wasn't even a riot. It would be cheapening the events that day to call it a partisan red-blue issue. It was an insurrection. Its goal was to stop the steal, stop the peaceful transfer of power. A simple concept. So the memories on the floor that day that we could feel things changing as the speaker was up explaining the procedures and what we were going to do that day. And some of the statements that will resonate for many in this room and movements were when speaker was rushed off the rostrum. Okay, she's left that before. I was always hoping that it wasn't what it could or what it turned out to be. The Capitol Police, as they came up and started speaking, you'll recall that the Capitol had been breached. Tear gas was dispensed in the rotunda. Furniture being stacked up against the doors. And then those words, let's move it. As many of us tried to make it off the floor and if you were in a gallery, much tougher. But then one that I'll never forget. They're in the chamber. They're in the chamber. And each of these was a step of that increasing tension. They're right behind us. Let's move it. Then we heard the breaking glass. And then that sound, as many described, that we found out later on, it was a gunfire. Terrible day. Which made things that happened that day so much more substantial. It was Americans attacking Americans. Neighbor against neighbor. Citizens against ourselves urged on from misinformation from powerful individual, misled citizens to violence. The people's house was defiled that day and something 
we will never forget. So as we have discussions, December 7th, Pearl Harbor, 9-11, the Trade Center here in Washington also, January 6th, and what needs to happen there is the same thing that happened after those two previous events. We come together as one nation, as Americans. And that, my friends, is an opportunity moving forward. But what we need now is accountability. Our democracy depends on it. Thank you. Thank you, Don Norcross. Uh, and, and now I recognize my friend Madeline Dean from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for ensuring the dignity and the guaranteed recording of history this day. Thank you to my colleagues, to the staff, to the custodians, to the police. Thank you, Madam Librarian. Thank you to our historians, John and Doris. And thank you and my sympathies to Mr. and Mrs. Sicknick for your extraordinary sacrifice. I'm pleased to be with all of you today. I would not be anywhere else. Because as Lisa Blunt Rochester said, this is a day to remember, to reflect, and very importantly, to recommit ourselves to our precious democracy. I don't know about you, but I'm emotional. I'm emotional because my memories are very similar to many of yours. I was three days into my second term in Congress, excited to participate in the certification of an election, knowing it was ministerial, not to be terribly eventful, but surely I was excited to be there. I too was up in the gallery. I wanted to observe, as I was preparing my own arguments for the Pennsylvania challenge to come, I wanted to observe the arguments of the early states that were challenged. And so I stood there, shoulder to shoulder with Dean Phillips, hearing those challenges, mouthing the words, shame, shame for these arguments. And then I remember trying to go back to my office to finish my arguments. And a very large police officer stopped me and said, there's a bomb threat in Cannon. Please go back to wherever you were. So I went back to the gallery and stood there again and heard those series of commands from the floor from I didn't know who at the time. Please sit down. Please prepare to kneel or lie down. Please get your gas masks out from under your seats. Like so many of you, like Rosa, I had no idea. And as we fumbled with the gas masks, I headed to the rail, to the wall at the rail. I remember calling Lucille over to me. I remember seeing Veronica in a gorgeous white jacket, standing, uh, readying her gas mask and screaming, get down, get down. And then the pounding on the doors. That haunting sound I will never forget. Put on your gas mask. And out we went, Paul Tonko behind me, up and over railings, till we got to some safe place and the constant whirring of the gas masks. The lies that stormed the Capitol, Capitol one year ago these hours remain a threat to our democracy, to you and to me, to our children's future today. That's why I'm particularly proud of our president for his powerful historic speech today. Agreed. He quoted the Bible, and I think, John, you did too. He said, we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. I am a woman of faith. I do believe. You know, in my six decades on this planet, I had no idea the precious nature of our democracy. No idea. Just as William Brennan once said, the Constitution will endure if we have the courage to defend it, the vision to interpret it, and the fidelity to live by it. You know, in the end, with apologies to our librarian and to Doris and John, 
The words that keep coming to me are from a president in a movie. Michael Douglas. Forgive me, please, John. Doris, you're going to be all right? When in that beautiful speech, he said, America isn't easy. America is advanced citizenship. You got to want it badly. Thank you all for wanting it badly, because it will take every one of us nationwide to eagerly, faithfully, thankfully participate in this historic course in advanced citizenship for ourselves and for our children. Lucky me to pass this way with you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline Dean. Uh, next is my friend Robin Kelly from Illinois. Mr. and Mrs. Sicknick, it's an honor to have you here and that you are gracing us with your presence. So thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for being the legendary leader that you are. And thank you, Jason, for your leadership and the comfort you gave me and others that day. I will never, ever forget that. Colleagues, when I walked into the Capitol one year ago today, I never imagined I would be on my hands and knees with staffers, colleagues, reporters, and cameramen, all hoping we got out safely. Thank God we did. As someone who has worked so hard on gun violence prevention, I remember thinking to myself, is this the way it's going to be? Meaning, is this the end for me? Thank you to the hundreds and hundreds of people who checked on me that day. Thank you to the Capitol Police and staffers who did their job to protect us and our democracy. There are still so many hurting mentally and physically, as we have heard. I learned that day just how fragile democracy really is and that we have to work at it each and every day and not take it for granted. I also realized, as a black woman, some of this was about us and other people of color. It was about loss of power, fear of not being in control, and the browning of America. Our beloved colleague John Lewis said that the vote is the most powerful nonviolent agent of change you have in a, in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. My colleagues, our guests, and all those listening, this is a day in my life I will never forget. We must not forget those who lost their lives. We must make sure that those responsible are held accountable no matter who they are. We must make sure the right to vote is preserved and we must do everything we can to protect our democracy. And last but not least, I just wanna to say to the gallery group, thank you, love you, and we go on. Thank you. Thank you, Robin Kelly. And next is my friend Stacy Plaskett from the U.S. Virgin Islands. Thank you, Jason, Madam Speaker, colleagues, and members of the Capitol Hill family including Mr. and Mrs. Sicknick. You are members of our family now as well. Last year, our country demonstrated to the world the best and the worst of our country, our democracy. In Georgia, grassroots organizations having worked for months to get people registered and to come out and vote saw the fruit of their efforts as Americans of all walks of life, young and old, black and white, poor and rich voted and elected two new senators from Georgia, showing that your vote can make a difference, can change history, can make representation matter. At the same time, a president, a man and his cronies, drunk with power and intent on keeping the spigot of that power open, plotted and used the frustrations, ignorance, fear, anger, bigotry of many as a fire hose to push away the election results and destroy our democracy. The efforts of that day, January 6th, were crushed 
by the brave men and women of the Metropolitan and Capitol Police who defended the citadel of democracy, who put their lives as barriers to the hordes of hell unleashed by Donald Trump to stop the peaceful transfer of power. Now, on that day, I was in my office and I had, was putting on my jacket because I wanted to come to the floor and stand behind my law professor, Jamie Raskin, as he was speaking. I wanted to be there, to stand next to him, behind him, and show support. I was frustrated because as I was leaving my office, my staff told me, you can't leave the office, you have to stay exactly where you are. And I got so frustrated, I was so angry, knowing that I could not be with you all. In the Virgin Islands, they say, I like to be in things. And I wanted to be in things with you all right there. And if you can believe, I actually pounded my fist on the desk. Can you believe that? That I couldn't be with you all. But God is good. Madam Speaker, God is good. Because a couple of months ago, uh, maybe two months ago, I was walking to the Capitol and Jamie Raskin, in his usual rambling way, was talking to me about his book and wanted to show me the picture that he was using of me in his book. And because, Madam Speaker, you had allowed me to stand next to him in the impeachment, the picture that he had of me was me standing behind him with my hands crossed, being there with him by his side. I got my ability to be in things with you all. The good staff and workers in the Capitol cleaned and prepared these hallowed halls to continue the work of certifying our election. They all demonstrated what is good and right about this country. And the men and women of Congress, my colleagues, determined that they could not be stopped from upholding their oath and their constitutional duty to come back and certify the election. January 6 was and should be called Democracy Day. What of our democracy now? What are all the, where are all the patriots who value their democracy, this democracy over power? Not only have so many of my colleagues, so frustrating to me, perpetrated a lie because it is in their personal interest to do so, they have worked so hard to continue to thwart the organization and push for the expansion of American democracy by hindering voting rights and make it harder for people to participate in this democracy. However, like the grassroots men and women who are working to hold the line, pushing for voting rights to keep fair and safe elections, we all here are doing our part for the people on this Democracy Day. Thank you all. Thank you, Stacey Plaskett. Uh, now I recognize my friend Lizzie Fletcher from Texas. Thank you so much, Jason, uh, for bringing us together. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for making this possible for Mr. and Mrs. Sicknick, for my colleagues and friends who are here today. I'm so glad to be with you on this day to add to this collective remembrance of the events one year ago today. So many of the stories we've already heard are my own stories too, because this is an experience that we shared together, and your memories are my memories. I've gotten used to going last because of my wonderful committee assignments, so anticipating that some of my stories may already have been heard, I thought I would share with you all of the many memories of the many, many acts of bravery and heroism and compassion during this unprecedented and really unimaginable before that time attack on our democracy one year ago today. I thought about a moment that for me was perhaps the most terrifying of that day. 
It was the moments just before those of us who were trapped in the gallery were able to get out. It was when we were waiting for someone to open the door. We had heard the mobs outside. We'd heard the banging on the doors that we've heard about. We heard the rattling. We heard the gunshot. We didn't know all that was happening around us then, but we watched and waited as the brave Capitol Police officers who were with us in the House Gallery were trying to determine who was on the other side of the door and whether it was safe for us to get out. And at that moment, we couldn't know. But when they opened the doors, I was so relieved to see Capitol Police officers there. They had secured a path for us out of the gallery to get us to safety, to get us out of the chamber. to get us, we thought, out of danger. I felt a wave of relief as I walked out of the gallery. I saw immediately to my right what others have described just beyond the stair, part of our escape route, men lying, spread eagle, on the floor with the Capitol Police officers' guns trained on them so that we could pass, so that we could escape. And Capitol Police officers stationed themselves along our path, guiding us to safety at every turn through the stairs and the tunnels. And I felt a sense of relief, but also a sense of uncertainty. And I found myself trying to say cheerful, reassuring things to people around me, and one in particular. As we approached an elevator near what I learned would be our destination, one of the Capitol Police officers looked at me and very calmly, but very clearly said, hurry. It was clear to me in that moment that we were not, in fact, out of danger. And every day of this year, I have remained so grateful to the many Capitol Police officers and police officers from the Metropolitan Police Department and others who faced those dangers that day, who saved our lives that day, who saved our capital that day, and who saved our democracy that day. And I share this story now because as I thought about all of the things from that day, it is clear to me that in this moment, we are not out of danger. Our democracy is still under attack. And all of us, every single American, has a role to play in preserving, protecting, and defending it. And as we just heard from our distinguished historians, our history is still being written. And we, all of us, as Americans, we get to write it. That is the beauty of our democracy. That is what we are celebrating and remembering and honoring and recommitting ourselves and vowing to protect today. Thank you, Lizzie Fletcher. And now I recognize my friend, Stephanie Murphy from Florida. Asked about the future of American democracy, uh, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright called herself an optimist who worries a lot. I can relate. I was born in Vietnam after the Vietnam War and my family fled communism and was given sanctuary here in America. I became the first Vietnamese American woman ever elected to Congress and I love America and I deplore those who threaten her security or who violate her values. And it doesn't matter if that threat is external or internal or comes from the extreme right or the extreme left. And I think such patriotism is fairly common among refugees. Having received America's grace and generosity, we feel duty-bound to defend the nation that came to our rescue. We understand America may fall short of its ideals at times, but we never take America as an idea for granted. We believe democracy and democratic capitalism are the best ways to promote security, justice, and prosperity. 
We know what the alternatives look like because our own families endured them until they were able to escape them. As immigrants, we've seen our native countries disfigured by dictatorships. We also recognize there is nothing inevitable about the survival or success of American democracy. It must be preserved by patriots of all political stripes, generation after generation. And in recent years, Secretary Albright has warned our democracy is endangered from within. January 6 proved her right. Four decades after my family fled violence in Vietnam, I was in the heart of the US Capitol, fleeing from my fellow Americans. Members of the angry mob were lied to by powerful people willing to discard all of the things that actually make America great in their ruthless effort to retain power. And many of those same people are now trying to dismiss or downplay January 6. One goal of our bipartisan committee investigating the attack is to hold those who incited it accountable to the American public and in the judgment of history. Today is a time for national reflection. We remember a harrowing day when we witnessed the worst of America, but also the best of America. We honor the officers who kept us safe and enabled the election to be certified. This is also a moment for national resolve. We, the American people, should resolve never to take American democracy for granted, to cherish it and to defend it. If we do not, we will lose it. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie Murphy. And now I recognize my friend and fellow combat veteran, Ruben Gallego from Arizona. Thank you for this opportunity um, to at least give some reflection. The one thing that, that always strikes me, especially hearing my colleague Stephanie Murphy and also as the son of immigrants, is how much we love this country. Whether you are an immigrant or the son of immigrants, you, rec you recognize that this country is great. This country is beautiful. This country is the best country in the world. It's for those reasons as a young man that I decided to join the Marine Corps because I felt that I needed to repay this country for everything it had done for me and for my family. And many times, unfortunately, I had to deal with the idea of dying for my country. And I remember as a young man thinking, would I be happy knowing that I'd done everything I can for this country? And at that point, at that young age, I said yes. Yes, I was willing to do it. I never thought that I had to think about it in that way again, until well, like many of you, with many of you, including luckily a, a former linebacker standing next to me, uh, we had to contemplate actually defending the floor of the House of Representatives. And at that point, I thought about what it meant. Was I willing to die for my country? Was I willing to die to make sure democracy continues. And at that time, around this time last year, I said yes, yes I would. And I'm proud to say that I know I'm not the only person in that room that was willing to do everything they could to the full extent as good Americans to save democracy. There was a room full of Democrats and some Republicans that said we were not gonna let democracy die that night. And we didn't. We didn't. We came back to the floor after seeing the horrific battles outside, knowing that there was still danger, knowing that the potentially were still bombs and IEDs and pipe bombs everywhere. We knew we had to go down to that floor and save democracy. I am proud of what we did that night. I am proud of what we're doing now. I'm proud of what we need to do going into the future to save this country and save democracy. Uh, my family doesn't really come from means whatsoever. We're a very proud family, though. But the one thing that I hope to give to my son, and I think every American should be able to give to their kids, is the one inheritance, and that's the inheritance of democracy. Let's make sure we continue to give that inheritance forward. Thank you.
Thank you, Ruben Gallego. Now I recognize my friend Mary Gay Scanlon from Pennsylvania. One year ago, when we returned to the House floor to certify the 2020 election, I was driven by two emotions, anger and determination. One year later, I'm just as angry and even more determined. As the chaos unfolded around us on January 6, 2021, I was locked in my office alone, fielding concerned calls and texts from family and friends and staff while getting tips from a friend who's a high school teacher on how to barricade my office door. She had done that before, I hadn't. I was most concerned, as others have said, that my children not be worried. So I sent them a picture of me with a bottle of Jameson's I had found in one of my staffer's cupboard. <laughs> when we returned to the House floor late that evening to fulfill our constitutional duty and finish the job at hand, we were only beginning to understand how close we'd come to losing our precious democracy, and how bad things had been at the Capitol. It's hard to watch. America survived a coup last January, but just barely, and only because of the strength of the members of this body and the bravery of the law enforcement officers who threw themselves into the breach that day. For a moment when we returned, there was an all too rare sense of unity and camaraderie because we'd all just been through something but it was a very brief moment. While nearly every member of the House and Senate condemned the attack on the Capitol, 147 of our colleagues returned to give credence to the rioters in their vile mission by voting to overturn the election results. And as a member for, from Pennsylvania, most disturbing to me were the members of the Pennsylvania delegation who voted to reject the self-same ballots that had led to their own induction just three days earlier. There can be no unity without a shared truth. The former president, members of this chamber, right-wing media personalities, and social media accounts have spent the past year doubling down on the big lie. They still insist, without evidence, that the 2020 election was rigged. Worse now, they want us to believe that the attack they once condemned never happened and that it was not a violent anti-democratic attempt to overturn an election. The people who came and attacked the Capitol and our Constitution on January 6th last year came at the invitation of the former president and were motivated by the lies he told and the failure of others who knew better to contradict those lies. It is my honor to serve in this Congress with the brave and principled and patriotic men and women who bravely serve this country here every day. And I don't just mean the members, but I also mean the staff and the law enforcement officers who protect us here. I pray that in the coming year, we will see the heroic fruits of the labors of the January 6th committee lay the groundwork for truth and reconciliation for our entire country. And in closing, just God bless this house, God bless all who serve here, and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Gay Scanlon. And now I recognize my dear friend, Susan Wilde from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Jason. I am incredibly honored and grateful to be here today with all of you, with Mr. and Mrs. Sicknick as a mother, my heart goes out to them. Um, and with my son, Clay, who, with his sister, um, serves as the inspiration for my life. You might think my son is here to, to watch his mother give a testimonial, but in reality, Doris, my son is here because you are here, and because he would not miss the opportunity to be in the same room with you. You too, John. But I still remember the day of President Obama's first inauguration when my then 16-year-old son met you on the, house, on the mall in that frigid weather and was more delighted to see Doris Kearns Goodwin than the many celebrities who were moving about. So that's really why he is here. 
He's going to kill me after this for that. I am the woman in the red jacket lying on the house floor, the gallery floor, on my back with my hands to my chest. Um, that's my 15 minutes of fame. Not the one I would have chosen for myself. I would have preferred to be Andy Kim, heroically picking up debris from Sanctuary Hall after the insurrection in the wee hours of the morning, but so be it. It was almost the worst moment of my life. The, any, those of you who have lost loved ones know that there are even worse moments of your life. Um, but I do have some fragments of memories that I, that I want to share, that I, and I'll try not to be repetitive of the wonderful memories that my um, colleagues have shared. Um, but but some, some are worth uh, remembering again. I do remember our good friend and hero, Jason Crow, uh, telling us to remove our pins, our congressional pins, and, um, and, and it, uh, con realizing that it was so that people wouldn't necessarily be able to identify us as members of Congress so that the insurrectionists wouldn't be able to, thinking to myself, but we're the only ones wearing suits and ties, and <laughs> surely they're gonna know who the members of Congress are, but nonetheless taking my pin off, and later that day, when we were in the safe room and I ran into one of my new freshman colleagues, a black man, and he still had his pin on and I said, you were, we should take our pins off. You need to take your pin off. And he looked right at me and he said, I want them to know I'm a member of Congress. And he declined to remove his. I remember being up in that house gallery and like everybody else, being amazed to find out that we had gas masks under our seats. I remember Jimmy Gomez having to help me open the black box and figure out how to use this gas mask, which was this incredibly unwieldy thing. And we were all wearing masks because it was still relatively early in COVID and we trying to figure out how to put a gas mask on over the mask that we were wearing on our face. I remember being incredibly concerned for Pramila, who had just had this, this knee surgery and was on a brace. I remember as we crawled around to the other side of the gallery, losing my shoe and being torn between trying to find it and just getting out of there. And then at some point I remember saying, dumping my backpack because it was getting in the way. It was just too much. Don't you know, later in the day, both my backpack and my shoe were returned to me by none other than Jason Crow. And I remember as we crawled around and got close to the end, people and realized that we were still going to be locked in there because of a distur new disturbance out in the hallway. I remember hearing people around me starting to call their loved ones. I specifically remember Terry Sewell in front of me and hearing her say, Mama. And I actually remember struggling with whether to call my adult children or not, because I didn't want to alarm them, and because I didn't realize at that moment in time that they were watching it all in real time on cable TV. And then calling them, FaceTiming them, and seeing their faces and the worry on their faces and, fe and feeling this concern about whether I was causing them more harm than good by calling them. Would they be more worried by seeing me and hearing, or would they be more reassured to hear from me? And I've tried, as a mother does, to reassure them and tell them that I was okay, to which my son said, Mom, we know what's going on. We can hear breaking glass. How can you say you're okay? And that was just like a dagger through my heart. Because we all know as parents that the last thing in the world we want to do is cause our children any kind of worry or concern. But um, I then remember getting off the phone with them and just feeling this sense. I, I, actually, I thought I was having a heart attack. I felt my heart pounding through my chest. I was certain I was having a heart attack. I think it was in that moment 
that that picture, which was taken, although I don't remember ever being in that, that position. So yes, it was just about the worst moment of my life, but from that moment has come so much good. Um, the, we've all thanked the US Capitol Police. And I have to tell you that I haven't watched much footage from that day deliberately, but when the Capitol Police chose to testify before the, September, before the January 6th committee, I watched every minute of it. And that day, it's, it dawned on me for the first time how close we had been to, to real, genuine threats, danger, and that those men and women of the US Capitol Police stood between us and the insurrectionists. That was the day that it really, really struck me. And um, getting back to that photograph, the memory that I have that is the strongest, as I lay there feeling like I might be having a heart attack, feeling Jason Crow take my hand and say in this very calm and soothing voice, you're going to be okay, you're going to be okay. And it was about the best thing that anybody could have possibly said to me at that moment. He was so calming and so soothing. And from that day, I have developed this amazing friendship and bond with my colleagues throughout the caucus, but especially my gallery group colleagues who were there with me in those final moments when we thought we were trapped. I, I remember us helping each other picking things up after each other. Um, and we have since just become a real connected and um, bonded group of people, the dearest friends I will ever have, I think. So let me just say this. I think of all these people who have given me support from that day forward. And I say, let us all be the support that everyone needs. We have to find our commonality. Engage those who don't agree with you. Talk to them. That neighbor who flies a political flag that you don't agree with, find something to talk to that neighbor about that you can agree on. The flowers and their beauty. The dog. The, ch the frolicking children in the neighborhood. The weather. Find something that you share with that person with whom you disagree on political matters. And most of all, don't take the bait from those who attack. Think of your portrait. I'll always remember that, John, and I thank you for saying that. You said it so well, a democracy is a manifestation of all of us. And that's what's so important for us to remember. That's really what a democracy is. It's not a group of people who all agree with one another. It's a whole bunch of us. It's a manifestation of all of us. So as um, was said in a piece that Jason and I published this morning in the Washington Post, our democracy is not inevitable, but it is a true gift that we must always honor by putting democratic principles over our differences. It doesn't necessarily come easily, but it's essential. Thank you. Thank you, Susan Wilde. Uh, and next, I'd like to recognize my friend Joyce Beatty from Ohio. Thank you, Madam Speaker, members, Capitol Police staff, and thank you, Congressman Crow, for presiding and your courageous leadership. Just a year ago, we watched in horror as armed insurrectionists laid siege to the seat of our democracy. We feared for our lives and the lives of our staff. We bunkered down and sent prayers up while we watched domestic terrorists hoping to dismantle our democracy. January 6th was the first meeting of the Congressional Black Caucus in our 50th anniversary year and my first as chairwoman. 
As I reflect on that day, I remember our U.S. Capitol came dangerously close to being destroyed. Although that infamous day is a painful stain on our democracy that will resonate for years to come, I am reminded that the week of January the 6th also marked the swearing in of the largest number of black Congress members in our nation's history. Yet I listened as my young staffers called their parents in a state of terror, asking me, are we going to die? Will we make it out of this alive? And why is there only one survival kit for a member? I remembered the banging on the door as Congressman Stephen Horsford, almost carrying a staffer, banged on the door for a place of refuge. Despite the Capitol Police ushering me to shelter with many of my colleagues, where I watched the courageous Lisa Blunt Rochester, fight for our health safety. I knew I had to be with my young staff, despite being told no. But I will forever remember Congresswoman Val Demings, who fiercely evoked her years of policing and personally guided me back to the office where those young staffers were crying. For hours we waited, we prayed for safety, the week of January 6th was indeed a watershed moment in our nation's history. Reflecting on the moments of terror and tragedy, a Confederate flag being flown in the United States Capitol, and Capitol Police officers putting their lives at risk for us to protect us. I am reminded of the advancements that we've made as a nation Today, we stand strong, renewing our commitment to democracy and promoting racial equality in the face of opposition. My dear friend and late colleague, Congressman John Lewis said, our struggle is not a struggle of a day, a week, a month, a year. It is a struggle of a lifetime. So January 6th, reminds us that even in the face of a struggle and insurmountable barriers, our democracy will stand. Our democracy will stand. God bless us, God bless America. Next, I'd like to recognize my friend, Veronica Escobar from Texas. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for bringing us together, Jason. I'm so grateful. Madam Speaker, I'm so grateful for this opportunity, the opportunity you've given us to be able to address one another and our country. I'm so honored to be in the presence of the Sicknick family as well. Thank you, my colleagues, but thank you especially my beloved gallery group. One year ago today, I was trapped in the gallery with about two dozen of my Democratic colleagues and members of the press. In fact, I was in the final group of members and journalists who made it out of the House chamber that day. The Capitol had long been breached, and we had already been surrounded by, for some time by insurrectionists intent on overturning our election and trampling over our democracy. I'm standing here before you today because Capitol Police saved my life. They saved our lives. They saved our democracy. I want to say thank you to each and every one of them, each member of the DC Metro Police, each member of the Guard, for their courage, their selflessness, and their bravery. I know many of them are still hurting, especially today, and we hurt with you. I want them to know, 
and I'm going to speak directly to them, I want you to know how grateful many of us are. My children still have their mother because of you. My husband still has his wife because of you. My mother still has her daughter because of you. Thank you. As terrifying as the attack on our Capitol was one year ago today, what should be even more terrifying to each of us is just how fragile our democracy is. While media executives and social media CEOs drown in profits, their platforms continue to spread the wild and toxic misinformation that has seduced and radicalized millions of our fellow Americans. A former president continues his dangerous efforts to take our country down a road that leads to authoritarianism. And too many people in power either look the other way or are only too happy to fan these deadly flames. The country that I grew up in is one where we came together during times of strife and great challenge, where we looked out for each other and we rooted each other on. I grew up in an America where we worked together to strengthen our democracy here and abroad. That is the country I am determined to give to my children and to their children, and to their children's children. It's the country I remain committed to. And I plead, I plead with my fellow Americans to join us in our effort to preserve our democracy for future generations to enjoy. Let January 6th be a reminder that we still have something precious within our grasp. Let us commit today to keeping, guarding, and revering it every single day of our lives, or we lose it forever. May God bless all of us, all of us, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you, Veronica Escobar. I am truly inspired by the leadership and the courage of the colleagues and the friends that we heard from today. And of course, most notably, uh, the men and women of the US Capitol Police and the Metropolitan Police who stood in the breach, literally, to save so many of us, and to save the election process. I grew up thinking that American democracy was inevitable, that it would just self-perpetuate generation after generation. And of course, we have all now learned that that is not true. There's no document, there's no tradition, there's no institution that accomplishes that. It's just men and women who stand up generation after generation to defend it. We now face unprecedented challenges disinformation, the spread of lies, the growth of conspiracy theories, the rise of domestic extremism and hate groups, attacks on our voting system, attempts to rig the election system so that only politicians can decide who wins and who loses. In the face of all of that, it's easy to get hopeless, to feel paralyzed by the sheer volume an unrelenting nature of those challenges. But that's not what we do. We don't get paralyzed. We don't stop. I believe this is an opportunity for us. This is an opportunity for a new type of American patriotism. And it will look different. It's a type of American patriotism that's rooted in humility and understanding that, yes, we've had problems and we still do, that there is strength in recognizing our challenges and understanding that we can only move forward and achieve that promise of perfection if we come to grasp 
with the realities that we face. A patriotism rooted in an unrelenting defense of the truth. And what that looks like is men and women standing up in town halls and parent-teacher conferences, at rotary clubs, at backyard barbecues across the country, in defending the truth and pushing back. And yes, that is uncomfortable. A patriotism based in courageous, selfless service. We need men and women to stand up and serve our country, serve their communities, engage, and join. We could have lost our democracy in 2021, but we have the opportunity in 2022 to save it. So let's make it a year of democracy in action. Volunteer, advocate, and engage. We can come through this better and stronger than we went into it, but only if Americans stand up, unite, and defend it. Now is the time for all good men and women across our nation to come to the aid of their country. Thank you for joining us today, and may God bless the United States of America.